are pretty on Ulysses. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel, and it's time for another Friday Reads. I think this might be the biggest Friday Reads of the year. I have been busy. So, I'm camping at the bit to tell you all about it. I have one bail. I haven't been bailing much recently, and I think the last time I mentioned bailing, I said that I was going to be bailing a lot more in December to make up for lost time because I'm just not going to put up with books that aren't enthralling me. And so I have one bale to tell you about, a book that didn't enthrall me, and that was Balzac's Cousin Bet. Sorry, Brian! I didn't hate it, but I didn't like it well enough to finish. I read a couple hundred pages, I think. It was a buddy read with Andrew Beyond the Pages, and I abandoned her after, I think, 178 pages or something. I just didn't really care. A little bit too cynical for my taste and overly preoccupied with financial enmeshment in a way that it ended up being a little bit too much fiction for accountants for my taste. Like I, I'm exaggerating slightly, but it was so complicated, the enmeshment of how the money was tying these awful people to one another. And it was, I just lost interest. There was nobody really to root for. The only good person was so naive that I didn't give a shit about her. And the rest of them were uninterestingly selfish and villainous. Again, I didn't hate it. It was mildly interesting, but that's all the best I can say, so I'm not going to finish. And I have finished five books. So I don't have much to say about the first one, because I kind of did a little bit of a rant on it last week, when I was almost finished. Deborah Levy's The Man Who Was Everything. And I can't remember exactly what I said, but if I can't remember exactly what I said, probably you can't either. So at the risk of repeating myself, this was a brilliant novel that just fumbled itself. Now it's interesting, I have since watched... Robert of Barter Horde's comments in his Friday Reads, and he had the almost opposite reaction. He hated the first half and loved the second. So there are many different readings of this novel, but I was beguiled and completely engaged with the first half. And then it wasn't immediately at that bizarre turn in the second half that I started hating it, but it was when a plot twist that was more of a realistic, e fictional type of narrative plot twist was introduced in a way that just was so jarring that I, I just never recovered. So I will read more by Deborah Levy, but this was a two-star miss for me. Several of the rest of them I will be doing full reviews of, so I'm not going to say a whole lot here, but I did finish and was delighted right up until the final page by this 1936 novel, Begin Again, by Ursula Orange. Again, to echo what I said last week, it's not a literary novel, but... It was really a gripping rom-com that had emotional resonance, a lot of humor, and for an author's debut novel at the age of 27 in 1936, a lot of wisdom. A lot of things that like very much showed what life was like then, but a lot of other stuff that kind of said, yeah, I related to that as a gay guy in 1980s Saskatchewan, Canada, so... Can't recommend it highly enough. I love the covers of these uh, Dean Street Press furled middle brow editions, but I have to say, the eyes on all of these ladies are just, they're off in a way that's, the more I look at it, the, the more disturbing it is. Look at their eyes, there's just, the perspective is off. But I still love the covers, so that's as profound as it gets over here at Sean the Book Maniac today. <laughs> Uh, late last night, I finished Ermgard Coyne's The Artificial Silk Girl, a masterfully translated by a translator who I can find nothing about online, and uh, so apparently this is her first translation. I hope she's a young person with decades of more time left to translate, because this is one of the best translations I've ever read. The translator's name is Kathy Von Ankum. You can see her name spelled in the show notes. If anybody knows anything about her, I couldn't find out anything about her. Uh, wow, this is just amazing. So I think I have found another favorite writer. I can't base it on one book. Wow, I loved it so much. So I want to send a big 
smoochy hug to Mal of Mel's Bookland Adventures for recommending it to me. She she uh, championed it on her channel several weeks ago, which is how I found out about Ermgard Coin, and I will be reading much more by her. Another uh, 1930s, 1932 novel, which just shows the excesses of the dying days of the Weimar Republic, the encroaching Nazi darkness, and just an incredibly lovable, complex, hilarious, big-hearted protagonist that I just will never, ever forget. <laughs> Stay tuned for my review. Last night I also finished this latest in the Faber Story series. This is Anna Byrne's 127-page story, Mostly Hero, about superheroes. I have not rated it on Goodreads, and I will keep you all in suspense about my reaction to it until Doris and I do our review. And just this morning I finished this Barbara Pym biography, Barbara Pym, A Passionate Force by Anne Allistry. Again, I'm doing a full review. I didn't think I was going to, but I loved it so much. It's not a perfect book, but uh, any book that has Barbara Pym mentioned more than twice is... <laughs> You know, probably a five-star read for Sean the Book Maniac. I loved it. I got so much out of it. Uh, I have to tell you some of the little tidbits in a full review coming your way soon. But, ah. Oh. So those are what I finished. So because I finished five, I have started seven. <laughs> and I'm happier than a pagan shit. So the first one that I started was this collection of... Uh, Short stories by the Canadian short story writer Audrey Thomas. Two in the Bush and Other Stories. This is a buddy read with Lindy. Now, a buddy read with Lindy, I have had one or two in the past, but there's something extra special about doing a short story collection buddy read with Lindy because she is just... What's the word? She's like the Buddha of short stories or something. She just has so much unique and deep insights. So uh, I read the story... I check in with her on Voxer, then I listen to her message and think, okay, well, now I need to read the story again because holy smokes, what a marvelous depth she went to to read the stories. And I consider myself a pretty deep reader, but oh boy, what a delight to be buddy reading it. I've read two stories, really enjoying the collection. Again, I, I don't have much more to say this early in the book, but great. I said I was embarking upon another buddy read with Heidi of My Reading Life and that we seem to be cursed at getting so many duds. Well, this hasn't ended up being a dud, but it's not very good. And maybe I'm not surprised. Maybe not even all that disappointed, but yeah, it's not very good. And that is J.L. Carr's debut novel from 1964, A Day in Summer. As I said last week, if you don't know, he is the author of one of my favorite novels, A Month in the Country which was published about 1979 or something. This is 1964. Probably the thing that I'm enjoying the most is that this is almost like a prototype for A Month in the Country. Some of the same, a lot of the same themes, and you can barely distinguish the settings. The writing is very different, and this novel is making so many newbie debut novel mistakes that it's hard for me to say that I'm enjoying it, but there are other things about it. Some of the characterization is good. It opens really enigmatically with a mild-mannered man who secretly leaves his wife, I don't mean separates from her, although that is part of what he's doing, and travels by train some distance away to a small town he's never been to because he needs to avenge his son's hit-and-run death. And the man that killed his son and was acquitted of uh, killing his son um, actually, I don't know if I know that it was a hit and run. Uh, maybe I'm just assuming that. But anyway, there w it wasn't... I don't know. It uh, yeah, I don't know how he killed the son. It was like an accidental, but should have been some kind of punishment. Uh, maybe I need to go back and reread those first couple pages. But anyway, so he's traveling to a place where he knows this guy's going to be to kill him. So that's a pretty enigmatic opening. But then when he gets there, there's so many coincidences, there's so many people there that he has known, he knew years ago in a very intense way. I guess it's not a spoiler to say he was served in the war with these men. He didn't know they lived there. And then he starts connecting with all the people in the town in a way that just isn't realistic for the larger plot. It's just really strange credulity. But I'm turning the pages and I will be not going to bail, I don't think, unless it gets a lot worse and enjoying discussing it with Heidi. When I bailed on Balzac, 
I thought. Sean, you can fit one more in that you had no intention of fitting in in December. What shall it be? And I chose from my bookshelf uh, Serious Blooms at Night by Shani Mutu, which is a Canadian classic that I that was brought to my attention by Camel of What Camel Reads. I mean, I, I was vaguely aware of the title, but Camel has a whole video on it, which I don't remember if I've watched. Maybe just watched enough. When I, I do that, when I see a video review of something that I that may, convinces me I need to read it, I usually stop the video and I'll go back after I read it. I think Eric Carl Anderson, maybe he had a comment on Camel's video that he loved it too. This was quite some time ago, so my memory's a little fuzzy, but it brought it into sharp focus for me, and I found a second-hand copy in Canada, and I pulled it off the shelf, and I'm about 20 pages in, and it's going well. I can't say much about it yet. It's set in a fictional Caribbean island, and there is an old woman who is being institutionalized in an old person's care home after being suspected of some kind of grisly murder that nobody was able to prove that she did it. And her attendant is a very gay Caribbean man looking after her and trying to keep his eyes off all the hot men around him. So yeah, there's a lot to admire here so far. Shani Mutu has a fascinating history. She was born in Ireland and grew up in Trinidad. And now, as of the time of this publication, which was 1996 and this paperback 1998, she was dividing her time. You only ever see that in a book author blurbs, don't you? Dividing her time between Vancouver and New York City. And I don't think she's published almost nothing else since this, but this is kind of one of those sleeper classics. Anybody else out there read it? Oh, just as I'm filming this, I'm getting a Voxer message from Natalie of my reading days. I sent her one a few days ago, and she's been so busy getting her Vlogmas videos up every day, you go girl, that I hadn't heard back from her. So I'm going to be checking that later. Well, I was hoodwinked by Scribd because I told you that I was going to start Lady Anna by Trollope, both because Angel Beyond the Pages really loved it during Victober, and recommended it very highly to me. And according to Scribd, the the ebook was only 200 pages. Well, that was just a, a mistake on Scribd's part. It's Lady Anna. I have the paperback edition. And I have the paperback edition because, A, this often happens with classic books that are available as an ebook on Scribd. I don't have this trouble with other ebooks, but classics that they can get for free. They're just kind of cut and pasted in and there's so many formatting errors and weird stuff that I abandoned it and then I got the what's the name of that website where you can download free classics it's such a famous website and you can put them right into Kindle and then I was doing that and then I was in, I enjoyed it so much from the first chapter that I, and I rarely do this with classics I'm not somebody who needs to have a paper copy of a classic uh, I don't even have paper copies of my Barbara Pims so I'm quite content to do ebook when they're free or much cheaper. But I checked, I don't know what, I think I thought I'm going to really like this. And I checked on Amazon Japan and this attractive, what is it? Oxford University Press soft cover was like $6 or something brand new. So I bought it and, and I actually am enjoying the font. It's quite pleasant to read, so I'm going with the paper version. I'm only, well, five chapters, four chapters in, and it's really good. It's really satisfying that hankering that I was left with when I abandoned Phineas Finn, and I'm just so engrossed in it. It's a crazy, dramatic opening that's so complicated, and it made me think similar themes to the Cousin Bet Balzac, Trollope's all about the money too, and his money plots are complicated, but he usually, and certainly in this novel, has a lot of other hum human drama and character development, and there's just something that's more humane, do I want to say, no, not humane, but there's just, he's writing about people more than money, and I just kind of lost the thread of the people, because they weren't so enjoyable either in the Balzac. Um that he's just hooked me. It opens with a young upper-class woman that gets married to a, an earl, so she becomes a countess, and then 
when she's pregnant a few months later, the, this nasty Earl tells her, <clears throat> actually, I have another wife in Italy, so this our marriage is null and void, and I'm going back to live with her now, so have a nice life. And he left her, and then it goes on, and she's got this daughter, Lady Anna, and there's all this legal wrangling, and it's so gloriously complicatedly described that I just love it. I'm not uh, counting this as a bail. I'm not conceiving of it as a bail. But I will tell you that I did read a few pages of Trent Dalton's Boy Swallows Universe on December 1st, and, and then again on December 2nd. I don't think I read more than 10 pages, but it just didn't grab me, and I, I'm not willing to say that it's a book that I don't want to read and that I don't want to try again in the future, but it didn't grab me when I picked it up. I tried it on audio with the book, and the, I didn't like the audio at all. And then I just read, and the, the writing just wasn't speaking to me. But I will give it an honest try when the spirit moves me, but not this month. So instead, because I told you last week, I wanted to do a tome in December. So the next one that I pulled off the shelf is Richard Powers' The Overstory. And this one's going a lot better. I'm still not sure, and I haven't, you know, how many pages have I read? Not quite 50. I'm still not sure that I will finish it, but it is really quite a piece of business. It's quite a piece of work. Um, I don't know that it's going to work for me, but I was mesmerized by the first few pages, the description of the chestnut tree. And I have had kind of a, a lifelong unexplored, I'm not a nature person, so when I say I have an interest in trees, I mean I like looking at pictures of them on the internet, but I have always been drawn to trees and what I've read about trees. Again, not really going and looking at them or hugging them, but, and I read that other novel that I can't remember, so I'll put the, the gif up here just a few months ago that uh, was in many ways about trees and so this one has been i've had this sitting on my shelf for maybe six months and i know natalie really loved it and britta bailed on it i think didn't you or certainly hated it steve donahue loves it passionately i think he's read it about 800 times this year um he actually has a good reads review of this i almost fell over when i saw he that he had a, i think he linked maybe to another review or something but uh, i've never seen such such Goodreads activity before from Mr. Donahue. Yeah, I was completely drawn in about the trees. And then the family, they were kind of take, took a back seat in the story. And then there was one page near the end of, or maybe the middle of that chapter, where the progenitor of the family, the, the one who emigrated in the late, mid to late 19th century, I think from Norway to America, and planted the chestnut tree in, is it Ohio or Iowa? I'm sorry, my American geography sucks. So does my Canadian and Japanese. But anyway, he takes a picture every on the 21st of every month, and then his son does that, and then his grandson, and then great-grandson, and so on, to show the way the tree is. And that's fascinating. But there's one page where there's a summary of all the things that befell or happened to or were made to happen by members of that family through the generations. And it read like a soap opera. So I thought, oh, maybe Richard Powers writes about trees better than he writes about people. Cause, uh, but, but at the same time, I was thinking, yeah, I've been fascinated by this tree, and then there's a page of what the humans have been up to. And I think, even though it reads very melodramatic, that I... Still, I'm more drawn to the people than trees in my fiction. Is that wrong? So I was left that story kind of sh on shaky ground because it seems to be a series of unconnected short stories about separate, different group of characters. And uh, trees figure prominently in each chapter. And then apparently everything is brought together in the end. Second chapter it was about a completely different family, a Chinese American, uh, a Chinese immigrant uh, to America, and I fell in love with him in a way that I didn't really care about any of the characters in the first chapter, not not nearly as much anyway, and I just, just loved that guy, and the 
tree. It was a mulberry bush. What was it? I forget the name of the, the kind of tree in the second chapter. Is bare really background like you, you you barely remember that it's about a tree it's mostly about the family so i don't know what he's up to but i'm turning the pages and i'm not going to if i bail i'm not going to bail abruptly i'm going to take my time with it because it's intriguing the crap out of me so far i am not bored i am i am uh, befuddled about what's what's going on here and what how I feel about it, but I am engaged. I wanted to fit at least one more Welsh novel in before the end of the year, and this is a tiny one, so it uh, fits the bill nicely. Anne Harad Price, The Life of Rebecca Jones. Her name, the writer's name, is fascinating. I have to say the title is one of the most boring titles for a novel ever, but I just started it late last night, and I sent a Voxer text to my lovely buddy reader friend, Litzy friend, Leah, in Canada. Sent her a picture of me holding the book because I said, oh, actually, you know what I said? I said, Leah, I love you, so I want to tell you to drop all your books on the floor and pick this up immediately because she has this already. And said, so you have to read it. But I said, I also respect you, so take your time, but get to it as soon as possible. And then I said, showed her a picture of this and said I was going to start it. And then after I'd read, 10 pages or something, I, that my last comment of the evening was that I would need a day or so to decide whether it was just the wine talking, but the, it was, uh, I love the opening. So I haven't read any more today without wine. I will get to that as soon as I finish filming this video, but my memory, I, I wasn't too deep in my cups, but uh, my memory of those few pages was that it was uh, starting out a historical novel and it's a wisp, little wisp of a thing, 160 pages translated actually translated from the welsh by lloyd jones originally published in welsh 2002 this english translation is 2014 it's a historical novel about a new bride that comes to live with her new in-laws and meets a very icy reception from her new mother-in-law oh, and that's about as much as i can tell you at these early days but i'm liking the way it's starting and it's kind of a, one of those hybrid things which often throws me off but it says on the back a masterpiece of rural history on the one hand, a poetic work of fiction on the other. And there are photographs in it. I can't pronounce any of these place names, and I'm not sure why, what the point of putting black and white photographs in on such crappy paper. But there, there's that one. How many pages did I read? 20. I am Googling everything. I'm doing this more and more googling place names or anything like that historical references as i go so even though it's 160 pages it might take me a few weeks to finish but starting out really good and i thought that would be it i just went through a bunch of stuff and there was a list of the best canadian fiction released by cbc i'll put a link in the show notes and one of the books on that i found on scribd as an ebook and i went to bed and be just before nodding off i read the first story in this collection uh, it has a fabulous title, Shut Up, You're Pretty, Stories by Teya Mutanji. So it's starting out really good, and I'm so glad that I just kind of, the wine made me do it, but I'm really glad. It's a, it's a short, short story collection. It was just kind of a spontaneous decision late last night that I wanted to diversify my December reading a bit more. Uh, she was born in the Republic of the Congo, came to Canada with her family as a child, grew up in the Scarborough District of Toronto. This is her debut short story collection. I love the first story, and actually this today I read the second story, and I really liked it too. So I think it's going to be a strong story collection, and linked short stories, which I love, that genre. Oh, and I see, as usual, Jacqueline of Six Minutes for Me has already beat me to it. She talked about this book six months ago. Well, I concede. You're always there before me, Jacqueline. More power to you. So those are what I've started, uh, a ton. It's such a happy problem. And the only one that I'm going to start, and this is, I have been looking forward to this buddy read and this book for months, ever since Kendra and Jacqueline and Robert and Doris, were you in? Doris, I think you were in on this too. This buddy read of the uh, Indian novel, The Far Field by Madhuri Vijay, a buddy read with Britta Bowler starting Sunday. 
I just can't wait. I just know I'm going to love it. I'll, in other words, I'll be bitterly disappointed and blame everything on Britta if I don't. No, I won't blame anyone. Is it an Indian novel or is it a Bangladeshi? Oh, I know. I always get confused Bangladesh and Bangalore. So she's Bangalorean, but that's a province or state of India, right? Oh, Bangalore is the capital city of the Indian state of Karnataka. Okay, well, there you go. Maybe I've got that sorted in my mind. And once I read the book, I'll have it in a lock there. I just can't wait. I just can't wait. If I finish a bunch of more stuff, then I will add more stuff as I go. But nothing that's uh, planned. I only have one more buddy read that doesn't start until the week after this. So I think this is all just a, a fabulous muddle of bibliomanic goodness. What about you? Thanks for watching.